During university, I had a slew of creepy encounters. This has stuck with me the most. It started during my first class. One day a group of us were walking together along campus and slowly members began branching off. It ended up as just myself and a guy who I was not inclined to befriend, only knew his name, but I didn't want to be rude and not keep walking along with him. He asked me where I was going and I tell him I normally take a nap between classes and was going into my dorms. He asks if he can see my suite. Normally this would be a no-brainer red flag, but my particular building was renowned for being fancy and others frequently asked to see inside. I say sure, not wanting to be mean and thinking this guy would take a quick look around and give the typical jealous comments and then leave. We go inside and I show him the basics, doing so in a way that we ended back up at the entrance of the suite. This whole time he's not saying much and I'm only announcing things dryly. So I was confident when I said a quick, it's pretty nice, see you around, Then he was going to take his leave. I turned around and went to my room. I did not show him any rooms or say where anyone stayed. A few minutes later, as I'm sitting my stuff down, I turn around and he is there in the doorway. He's silent. I don't say anything because I do not want to invite him in. I want him to go. I just look at him, then start picking up stuff and moving it around, trying to look busy. He slowly walks a couple of steps into the room and asks, Have you done the coursework yet? I tell him no. By this time, I assume he is trying to hang out and tell him again that I'm planning on napping. He doesn't even skip a beat and says, That's okay. I can watch you sleep and help you with it after. I smile. No tone. Then silence again. I immediately tell him he needs to leave and follow him until he actually went out the locking doors and I know he can't follow me back in. I told a lot of our friends about this and they were heavily creeped out and made a point not to leave us alone again, ever. We finished the year out and I haven't thought about this guy in a long time. I did not know anything about him at all, still only knew his name. Flash forward a year and some change to the next summer when I'm taking a bus ride home from a different part of campus, so it is not my normal route. We get to one of the points where the bus stops and waits until a certain time before it can leave again and everyone else that had been on the bus gets off at this stop. At this point the driver starts talking to me asking me a lot of questions. I did not think anything weird at first and answer what I thought were idle chat questions. So which apartment are you in and what classes are you taking? Then as more and more questions just kept coming I started to feel uneasy with his mannerisms and became extremely vague in my answers. I still don't know if he always intended to tell me this but he then stopped peppering me with questions and began spilling a story of how his son was in my math class the previous year and he knew all about me and started giving me a lot of family details. It's at this point that I realize his son is the guy who wanted to watch me sleep. All the details fit, but I had to know for sure, so I asked him if his son was named what his name was. He smiles and says yes. He then mentioned that he would like to start riding bikes with me, and would I ride bikes with him and his son? I was gathering my stuff by this point and had decided to get off the bus. There are two doors, one at the front and one halfway, which was closest to me. The doors stay open while the bus is at these stops so people can hop off and on and the driver normally gets off and takes a break. As I'm getting my stuff and getting up, the halfway door shuts. I look again at the driver, an older man but much larger than my petite frame and build. He is now standing facing me but the front door is still open. He asks again, Will you ride bikes with us? I want off the bus and think the only way is to pacify him. I say yes and make my way to the front door not knowing how to get around him. He looks pleased but asks where I'm going. I try and tell him I've decided to walk home but he still blocks my way and tries to talk me out of it. I'm firm in that I want to walk from here but he will not move. I'm standing in front of him wishing to move but my body is frozen in place. Slowly, he decides, Give me your number, and I'll let you go. 
I really, really don't want to do this, but I also went off this bus immediately. My first thought is to give a fake, but I'm also glad I didn't as he immediately dials the number. It was a test. Seeing my phone ring and watching me save his contact, he moves enough that I slide by and make it off the bus. After making it home, I go to block his number and already have multiple missed calls and a voicemail of just him breathing. The situation was reported and I did not see him on route for a long time. But around a year later, I was getting on another bus and noticed he was back. I never covered my face and backed off a public transit faster. This is from my sophomore year of high school. Take in mind that some of the reasons why the whole scenario lasted so long was because I was extremely shy and was having problems with extreme anxiety. This whole experience has helped me learn to speak up for myself. It was the beginning of the school year and I had a gym class as my first period. I went to class normally for a few days, but I had noticed that some girl had been staring at me off and on. I didn't think it was anything to worry about. A big mistake on my part. One day before class started, we were all hanging out in one corner of the gym listening to our teacher's story of how he tripped and fell in a huge puddle of mud. I was sitting on a pile of yoga mats staring off into space, but still paying attention. I then heard a girl's voice say, Teacher, I have a story to tell too. I finally have found my best friend that I haven't seen in years, and she doesn't even recognize me. I was snapped out of my staring spell and looked towards the voice to find that she was pointing directly at me. I foolishly said, Oh, no, I remember you. And read off the name that was written across her gym shirt, Ellie, because I didn't want to seem like a jerk for not remembering her. Ellie instantly brightened up that I remembered her, and then proceeded to lift herself up off the yoga mats and sit uncomfortably close to me, enough that our entire bodies were squished together. I didn't say anything because I didn't feel it was necessary to cause a huge problem out of this because there was obviously something up with her mentally, and I didn't want to be rude about it. The class went on and Ellie and I were not in the same group, so I didn't have any problem with her that day. The next few days, we didn't have any assigned class groups, so Ellie was trailing behind me like a dog. She was starting to get extremely protective and forceful with me. I don't get cold very easily, but she insisted that I wear her jacket and would not leave me alone until I finally wore it. She also started to say things about hurting my actual friends, which was the final straw for me. Do whatever you want to me, but as soon as you bring my friends into it, I'm going to do something about it. I was finally going to bring it up to our principal. Putting that whole thing behind, our class today had the option of either volleyball or walking around the perimeter of the room. I decided to just walk around the room and had been doing that for around 15 minutes, until I sat on the ground by the bleachers to tie my shoes. Ellie dropped down to the ground too and watched me with extreme interest. All of a sudden, she grabbed my wrist and held our forearms together. We have the same veins. You want to know why? Because we were in the womb together. I used to hug you when you were scared in the womb. She said, This line freaked me out a lot at the time. Because one, our veins look nothing alike. She had one visible vein, while mine branch out into multiple. And two, we look nothing alike, and she was a year older than me. I decided to run off to the bathroom before I really freaked out, and stayed in there for almost the rest of the class. I returned later for the end of class roll call and left to go to the locker room. Ellie got dressed quickly and was just staring at me half naked getting dressed. It made me really uncomfortable. I lied and told her that I had to leave quickly because I had to meet with my boss at Olive Garden and hightailed it out of there into my next class. My next class teacher, who I trust dearly, had called me up to talk to her privately in her class and she said that Ellie has been talking about me non-stop in the class that she has her in. She recommended me to go to the police as soon as possible and she'll talk to the principal. This scared the life out of me. What 
In the absolute God, did my teacher know about Ellie that she would tell me to go to the police of all people? I called my mom and skipped the rest of the day. I stayed home the next day and went to the police station with my mom. They brought us into a room and I started off with just telling them the basic story of what was going on. I didn't even say her name. The guy that was talking to us said, Ellie Smith? I was dumbfounded. How did he know exactly who I was talking about? He went on talking about how she's in the police station a lot, but couldn't go into specifics because she was a minor. This didn't help with my anxiety. What did she do to be in the police station multiple times? The police couldn't really do anything, so the only thing I could do was switch my class. I was angry because I had made a few good friends in that gym class and I had to restart with a whole new class, but at least I was away from Ellie. The new class went fine, but over the course of the year, I would always run into Ellie in the halls. My friend even saw her turn around and look at me with one of the most terrifying faces she had ever seen in real life. She would always yell things along the lines of, I'm going to get you, which was extremely unnerving for me. I didn't want her near me or my friends, so I began stepping up and telling the vice principal himself whenever one of these instances occurred. This kept happening over the course of my sophomore year. I was hoping that she would forget about me because I had figured out that we had never actually met before that gym class. I never hung out with anyone other than my friend Paige in the time Ellie said we were best friends, and I even checked all my yearbooks. Not one thing even mentioned Ellie Smith. The morning of the first day of junior year, I ran into her before I even started my first class. I tried not to make eye contact. Later that day, the principal called me in and told me that Ellie said I flipped her off, which I didn't. I didn't even look at her. This whole game with threats and random incoherent screeches continued on through my junior year as well, and I feel like part of the whole high school experience was taken from me because I spent a lot of the time trying to figure out how to avoid her. She graduated and thankfully was gone during my senior year. This whole experience has honestly both traumatized me and helped me grow as a person. I learned how to assert myself more than I ever had done before, but I still swear I see her out of the corner of my eye. It's caused some paranoia that still hasn't gone completely away. There was a girl that's been stalking and harassing me since October of 2018. We were in the same class at high school six years ago. She was super shy, never spoke in class, and barely had any friends. I can't remember speaking to her more than once or twice through all of high school. To me, she didn't even exist. Then all of a sudden, many months ago, I woke up to a message in my Facebook inbox that read, F white people. She is Asian from what country I do not know. I thought this was really strange, so I replied back, what's going on? She had blocked my messages. I decided to just ignore it and go on with my life. About a month had passed, and I woke up to yet another message in my inbox. She had sent me a screenshot of an Instagram account in my name. No posts or followers, just an empty account with my name. I kind of freaked out a little and tried to reply, but... Yet again, she had blocked my messages. I tried to find the account on Instagram but couldn't. My name is very uncommon, so the possibilities that this was another guy's account was very slim. It certainly wasn't my account. I was very confused and kind of scared that she had created an account with my name and would post things pretending to be me. I contacted one of her high school friends and asked if she could deliver a message for me since I had no way of reaching her. To my surprise, they weren't friends anymore and hadn't spoken in months. I told my closest friends about what had been happening. They told me that they had received some strange messages too. I was seriously confused by this point. This one girl who nobody talked to or had any kind of relationship with was sending pictures of Instagram accounts, weird memes, and three-word sentences that made zero sense to me and many of my friends. I tried to think of why she did this. Had we treated her badly at some point? But I couldn't think of anything that we had done. I remember giving her a piece of gum one day, but 
that's about as close as any communication happened between us. I decided I would just try to ignore her and hope she wouldn't send me any more messages. But then around Christmas time, I woke up to my Facebook exploding with notifications and messages. I think I had around a good hundred plus notifications. She had been sharing all of my profile pictures and posts. I'm seriously freaking out at this point and open my messages. I've received 50 to 60 messages that all read, end your life. I tried to message her again, but surprise, surprise, she had blocked my messages. I was becoming really angry at this point. I clicked on her Facebook profile to block her and get rid of her for good. Before I went to block her, I scrolled down her wall. She had been sharing literally hundreds of posts and pictures of me, my friends, and some other people I had no idea who they were. I did some detective work and found her sister's Facebook profile and decided to send her a message. I took screenshots of everything she had done and sent it to her, asking why she was doing this. She freaked out when she saw what her crazy stalker sister had done. The stalker had deleted her sister on Facebook because of an argument they had had around October when this all started, so she hadn't seen anything she had done. She promised me she would talk to her crazy stalker sister and make her stop. I received a message from her sister a few hours later that she had talked to the stalker and promised she would stop, and she apologized. I was so happy this finally would be over, and I thanked her. Another few months passes, and we are now in February of 2019. I hadn't received any messages since I talked to her sister, and I had honestly forgot about everything that had happened. Two days ago, I was playing some games with my friends on my PC and talking on Discord. My phone was on the table and I saw it light up once. I had received a notification. I wouldn't bother to check it before the game was done. A few seconds after I get another one and another one. I could see my phone in the corner of my eye. Notifications came swarming in. Then I remembered the crazy stalker girl and got a really awful feeling in my stomach, praying this wasn't her again. I stopped playing and picked up my phone. Notifications still coming in. The stalker was sharing my pictures and posts yet again, and all had a caption like, End your life and I hope you die. I instantly blocked her. A few minutes later it happened again, someone with another username was sharing my pictures. I blocked that account instantly. She had created almost 10 accounts and I was desperately blocking all of them as fast as I could as soon as I saw a notification. I sent her sister a message again and told her I was going to report this to the police if she wouldn't stop. She told me she would talk to her. Angry, confused, and kind of scared, I went back to the gaming session talking to my friends about it. I went to sleep a few hours later. I woke up late the next day. It was hard to sleep after thinking about all that was happening. My cousin had received some messages from my crazy stalker. She had told him that I owed her money. I kept my calm and told him about everything and said that he should just go with it. I wanted to see where this was going. She thought my cousin was my father. He is a lot older than me and I could see why she would think that. She had a long conversation where she claimed that I had both stolen and hacked her phone and lent money from her. And that I was the reason she lost her scholarship and had to move. She said I owed her $10,000 which later became 50000 and then again she raised the amount to 100000 later in the conversation. All of this, of course, is some crazy lie. I'm so confused as to why she is doing this to me. I have no idea what I have done to her and I'm going to report this to the police tomorrow. I'm really scared of what she might accuse me of next. Or if she is going to show up on my door someday. All this is happening six years after the last time I saw her. So... Update. I just came back home after talking with the police. They told me I had a strong case and could press charges if I wanted to. I decided not to do it for now. I don't want to make it harder than it has to be. I will give her one last chance to stop. They will call her today and tell her to stop or face charges. Any further contact with me or my family will cause her to see consequences. Either way, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get her restraining order if she doesn't comply. I would also like to add that I do not think she's a violent person. She's never threatened my life directly, nor have I ever feared for my life. 
this plays a huge part of why I didn't press charges. I firmly believe that something terrible has happened to her within the last year and that she is really sick and in need of help. Her family knows about the situation and it's up to them or the authorities to make sure she gets the help if she needs it. What bothered me the most about this whole situation was the false accusations and not the sharing of pictures and messages itself. I'm happy with my decision and I hope I made the right call. This is my mom and dad's story. It was their honeymoon, they married in August 1980 in Australia, and they were driving along the Bruce Highway into a city called Rockhampton, Queensland. It was late at night, around 8pm-ish, and they had been driving most of the day. There was a very long stretch of road before you come into the city that is just bush, kilometers of it. At night the bush can be very scary. They had not passed cars for some time probably an hour or two. Out of nowhere, headlights appeared a long way behind them in their rearview mirror. That's fine, whatever. They keep driving as normal. Then the headlights start getting closer and closer. Dad is driving and says something like, What a bloody turkey. Look how fast he's driving. The car comes right up to them, with their high beams on, and follows them for about five minutes like that. Mum and Dad have a conversation about why can't the person just overtake them. Then the car completely backs off, like slows right down almost to a complete stop, hangs back about 1-2 to two kilometers away for a good 10-15 to 15 minutes. Mum and Dad both think that was super weird and creepy, but whatever, they just keep driving. Then the car speeds up again, tailgating, high beams, and sort of swerving into the other lane as if to overtake them. This goes on for another five-ish minutes. Mom and Dad are both really scared now. Remember, this is the days before mobiles and cell phones, and besides, there would have been no reception in that area to call for help, even if they had them. It's not over yet. The car backs off again, but not as far as before. The car hangs back there for about a minute before hitting the gas and absolutely flying past Mom and Dad and finally overtaking them. There appeared to be one person in the car, but they couldn't really see what they looked like. And there was also no number plate on the car to identify it, and I know Dad had told me heaps of times before, I actually can't remember what sort of car it was now. I feel like it was a sort of sedan thing, definitely white, and the car disappears up the road as if it were never there. Mum and Dad are shaken to their core, but pleased it was seemingly over. Not done yet. The road now becomes a bit more windy. Previously, it was almost straight. Mum and Dad come round a corner and the car is parked in the middle of the road, facing them, high beams on, both driver and passenger doors wide open, and the man, they could now see it was a man, standing in front of the car with his arms spread wide, spread as if to make them stop the car. Mum was screaming at Dad, Just hit him. Don't stop. Just hit him. And my dad... Being the bloody hero that he is, did not stop and drove around the man's car on the right-hand side of it, which would be the passenger's side as it was parked facing them. The man tried to get in front of Dad, I assumed to stop him from driving off, as he made this maneuver but couldn't quite get there in time. He was very close to the car and Dad nearly hit him. Dad absolutely floored it. He said he was doing around 130 to 140 kilometers per hour to get away from the man. They aren't sure how long they drove like that for, but they didn't slow back to the speed limit until they started to come into the city limits. They made it to their hotel and parked the car at the back of the hotel, so that you couldn't see it from the road because it was on the side of the highway and passing traffic could see the cars parked there. Mum was quite hysterical and told the reception lady what had happened. They called the police and reported it, but they never found the car or the driver. Fast forward many years later, Mum was watching the news and Ivan Milat had just been arrested. Mum screamed and called Dad into the lounge room. They both agreed it was the man they saw. They were absolutely adamant. I can't find evidence to suggest Ivan Milat was active in Queensland during that time, 
but I certainly won't call mom and dad liars because of what they saw. I imagine it was another creepy hillbilly who looked very similar to the backpack murderer. A few years ago, I was watching a movie at my mom's place, who at the time she was staying on site at an animal rescue. The rescue was a house on a couple of acres that had been converted into a rescue. The house itself more or less functioned as a normal home, with the exception of a few rooms that had been converted into kitten nurseries or to keep hutches in. But the backyard crisscrossed with pens for the rescue animals. There were surrounding properties, but it was kilometers away from the nearest station and very difficult to reach without a car. It was about 9pm, post-dinner, and all manner of creatures were sleeping soundly in their beds, most notably two dingo healer crossbreeds. These two dogs belonged to the owner and had the run of the property, sleeping on kennels on the veranda. They were little darlings once you got to know them, but quite intimidating when you first met, growls and all. Opening onto the same veranda was a laundry that functioned as a second kitchen. As this laundry opened from the backyard, the rescue staff kept the food, dishes, and utensils for the animals' meals in the laundry, rather than tracking muck through the house on their way to the kitchen. We were watching the movie on my laptop, about 15-20 to 20 minutes into You Are Next, when someone knocked at the front door. My mom immediately told me not to answer it, but... When I asked why, she had no explanation. My mom has pretty great intuition, but since the dogs weren't going off, I answered anyways. I swung open the wood panel door, but left the fly screen locked as a concession to her. A soft male voice came out of the dark. The porch light apparently needed replacing. I could make out his height, 5'9", body shape, thin as heck, a beard and not much else. He asked for someone whose name I'd never heard. When I told him there was no one here by that name, he said he was waiting for a taxi. But then he said he needed a taxi and asked to come inside to call one. His speech was meandering. By this time, my mum had joined me by the door, pointing at the window. The door was one of those single panels with glass windows from door to ceiling beside it. As we had the lights on inside and it was pitch black night outside, we couldn't see the collar but he had had all the time in the world to see us. Worried, she gave the caller directions to a payphone down the street. The caller insisted he needed to come inside to call a taxi. I insisted he use the payphone instead. He became quite angry and demanded we let him in. Afraid about being the only ones home that evening, my mum finally snapped and told him she'd call the police if he didn't go away, already dialing triple zero on her mobile. Eventually he stopped arguing and the prolonged silence suggested he was gone. Not wanting to return to the couch which was in full view of the door's glass windows as well as from the veranda, the back wall was floor to ceiling glass panels, we occupied our time in the kitchen, waiting. We heard another knock on the door. Nervous, we peered through the glass until we could make out blue and red flashing lights. We opened the door to two officers and started relaying the story. Suddenly, the officer closest to the door asked, Is this yours? We peered around the door frame. A knife lay on the windowsill. A knife my mother immediately recognized as being used for the rescue animal's meal prep. The officer said the description reminded them of a local homeless man who was known for drinking far too much and sleeping it off in people's sheds. As such, they were quick to dismiss it as a serious threat, but... Afterwards, my mother and I kept making creepy realizations. That knife came from the laundry in the backyard. How did the stranger get it without setting off the dogs? Without setting off any of the rescue animals? How long had he been hanging around the backyard getting to know the animals? Had he been watching us, too? What exactly did he plan to do with that knife if we had opened the door? I've encountered a person that I'll call Window Man that has really messed me up. This happened in the summer of 2018, so about eight months ago. 
some background story to help better understand the situation I was in and the layout of the apartment. My mom and I moved into this one-room apartment with one of my mom's colleagues, all females, for a short period of time, about three months to be able to save up some money for another apartment that we currently live in. So the apartment had a small bathroom and shower, a kitchen merged with the living room, a small room separated by a sliding door and a window balcony. We lived on the first floor and even I, being the short 5 foot 4 girl, managed to climb up into the window when I forgot my keys at home. Since the colleague needed some privacy, she chose to live in the small room. My mom would sleep on the couch in the living room and I'd sleep on the balcony on a mattress. Now when I would lay on my mattress, from my point of view I'd see the living room and the couch on my right and the windows on my left though there were some behind me that I wasn't really able to see. Now, the actual story, we moved in, and everything was going great the first month or so. I felt quite safe even though I was very suspicious from the very start of the windows since we lived on the first floor, and I should mention that I've never experienced anything paranormal, nor have I had sleep paralysis before. So one night I wake up, or at least I think so, I can't move. I can only blink my eyes and move my head. I look over to the windows and see what looks like a third of a man's head and a hand peeking through the window. I tried to scream and get up, but I couldn't move or do anything. I was so terrified. I saw the man slowly closing the window as if he was trying to not make any sound and lower his head as if he were leaving. I was freaking out but still couldn't move. I saw my mom on my right, sleeping on the couch, and on my left my hand was hanging off the mattress and my cat was headbutting it, as if he was trying to wake me up. I tried to scream again a few times but it doesn't work. I'm hysterical at this point and I feel tears welling up in my eyes. Suddenly I wake up. I shoot up from my bed, my cat still next to the mattress and my mom still on the couch, sleeping in the same position I've seen her in. I look out the window, panicking, and it's locked from the inside, just like I left it before going to sleep. I unlocked it and opened it, making sure that there's nobody outside. I close and lock the window and lay back down, sobbing. I just cried myself to sleep that night. A few days later, I've decided to tell my mom about the dream. I didn't want to at first because I thought that she wouldn't pay much attention to it, but since it had me so on edge, I told her and just as I expected, she told me that I had been listening to too many horror stories and didn't take me too seriously. After maybe a week, I forgot about the dream and moved on. And then one evening, everything was going fine. I was preparing myself for the next day since I had to do a big presentation in front of the whole class and I wanted to look my best. It was about half past midnight. I took a shower brushed my teeth and went to sleep as usual. My mom was still up on her phone, but about to go to sleep. I doze off peacefully. But suddenly, I wake up for no reason and have the massive urge to look behind me at the windows. To my horror, I saw a tall man in my window, about halfway in, with one leg almost on the floor. I panicked and thought that I was dreaming again but quickly realized that I can move, so no, I wasn't dreaming. Still being in a state of fear and confusion, I whispered, oh my god. And to my complete horror, the man looked up, all dark but eyes shining in the moonlight, put on the creepiest ear-to-ear -ear grin, put a finger to his lips and said, shh in the most menacing way ever. I had no idea what to do, so I said louder, Oh my god! And then I jumped and screamed, and started screaming like a banshee. The guy got startled and almost fell back, so I took the opportunity and closed and locked the window, just as he was about to try to get back in. My screaming woke my mom up, and she ran up asking what had happened. I started nervously explaining all that had happened and then we saw the dude climb up to our window again with the one right next to me trying to open it. As I saw that I screamed even louder and as he was opening it I pushed him and he fell down, calling me every name under the sun. 
He then tried to make up some terrible excuse, but in my panic state, I started yelling at him at the top of my lungs to get out. I kept on yelling for about five minutes like a total crazy person until the guy finally said something along the lines of, Fine then. Almost as if I was obliged to let him in and started walking away. I slammed all the windows shut and locked them, sat down on my mattress and proceeded to sob loudly as my mom was next to me, trying to calm me down. We thought that was it, but a few minutes later I saw him again, climbing up our balcony and I started screaming again, opened one of the windows and yelled so loud that I almost lost my voice. I closed and locked the windows and my mom and I went to the guard to tell him what had happened. I described the man to him as best as I could, but since it was dark I couldn't say much about his appearance. He told us to just go home and stay calm, that he'll handle the situation. When we were going back we saw about eight neighbors of ours standing outside wondering what had happened. They all gave us sympathetic looks as we went back home. My mom gave me some medicine to help me calm down and I was crying and shaking vigorously for about an hour until I was finally so exhausted that I just went to sleep with her since I didn't want to sleep on the balcony anymore. The next day I showed up to school looking like trash and when I told someone what happened, they either didn't believe me or would brush it off saying, it's fine, you're alright now. After a few days, my mom confronted me about it and said she was sorry that she didn't take my dream seriously, though I wasn't mad at all, just shocked. She said that she was just about to fall asleep but woke up to me screaming. She told me that my screams were the most blood-curdling ones she had ever heard in her life, but the scariest part is that I woke up for no reason. I just had the massive urge to look back. There was absolutely no noise when the man opened the window and was climbing in. I even asked my mother if she had heard anything and she said that no, it was absolutely silent. Who knows what the man would have done if I hadn't have woken up, though I'm glad I didn't have to find out. The fact that also really shook me is that I had a dream of something similar happening about three weeks before it actually happened in real life. Though sadly I don't know what happened to that man, if he was arrested or not, we never saw him again. But either way, I'm just glad that we moved out of that apartment. Soon, later. So one day about six years ago on a YouTube comment section, which I am convinced comprises the bowels of the internet, there was some guy posting full of bravado and self-praise about everything under the sun, while putting other people down in a fashion that I found unacceptable, even though he did have excellent grammatical and linguistic skills. In particular, he was singing his praises about his chess playing abilities, which he clearly took much pride in. Being the snarky booger that I am, I called him out on it, since he was definitely over the top and it sounded like a load of garbage. I mean, the guy stated that he was one of the top chess players in the world and went on and on about it, which I highly doubt was true. Really, it was nothing more than the typical playful banner of noise and nastiness that is YouTube comment sections. This guy, however, had narcissistic personality disorder. During the few comments we exchanged, he admitted as much but thought it was one of his biggest strengths rather than weaknesses and saw no reason to get help for it. From my understanding of NPDs, this is not uncommon. Anyways, having angered this guy, he made it his mission for about four weeks to research me extensively. By extensively, I mean that he probably made me his full-time job. I try to keep my social media accounts quite separate by using different usernames and posting few details about myself, but within the first week, this guy managed to locate most of my accounts and spent hours and hours posting insulting, nasty comments in response to my YouTube videos, my tweets my comments, my Facebook comments, etc. He doxed me, finding my PhD math thesis, posting it online repeatedly and criticizing my methodology, which was ridiculous. My PhD thesis was nominated for awards and laid out the foundation of a new area of combinatorics. I mean, this means that the dude read my PhD thesis, several hundred pages, just to criticize me. Given that it's in math, that alone is incredibly creepy. 
He responded to every YouTube video I had posted, taunting me with nasty comments and replied to hundreds of my posts, even five plus years old, attacking me on every detail of anything I said. We were talking small typos to some unintentional grammatical errors and a few bursts of outrage. I'm a gay man on many LGBT rights websites. It's hard to sometimes not be frustrated. I mean, this guy must have spent hundreds of hours researching me and posting in response to me from fairly old posts. While nobody else seemed to care, it was terrifying to me to get daily notifications from him, posting my full name everywhere with detailed information about my location and life. Fortunately, I live in a different continent than he did, even though he made some threats to come visit me. I figured it was best to ignore him, but it went on for, as I said, about four weeks, until some woman online, and a very talented chess player, made the mistake of insulting him about his grandiose delusions of being a master chess player, at which point he thankfully shifted sights to her. I messaged her privately and warned her about this unstable guy, but he still stalked her for several months, doxing her and demanding that she play him games of chess online at the threat of more doxing, telling her that she would play him on such a server at such and such a time, or else she would forfeit and be scorned. Much of the time, she said she had never heard of the obscure servers he mentioned, but he demanded that she comply. I finally lost track of him, but his posts remained online, containing all my personal information which is disturbing, seeing as I try to keep my social media accounts and my real life as separate as I can manage. I'm not ashamed of anything I say online, but I want the division and some reasonable level of anonymity all the same. So, to the crazy dude, proud of his narcissistic personality disorder, I hope we never meet again, and I hope that others remain safe from you. I've since learned to be much more careful about my online interactions and to not push buttons just for the sake of doing so, because sometimes it just isn't safe. This happened in 2006 in Provo, Utah. Two childhood friends and I had just moved from a small town to start college. There are two colleges in the area, one in Brigham Young University, predominantly Mormon population, and the other was a small state college at the time. It's now a university. Of course, us non-Mormon boys end up finding an amazing old house for rent right in the epicenter of Zubiville, a term used by non-BYU kids referring to students at BYU. It's loosely based on the premise that at one time the students weren't allowed to leave the campus, therefore they were trapped there like zoo animals. Knowing that we are technically in the territory for approval housing for BYU standards, we figured we were in a pretty alright area. Bizarre area, but nothing crazy. We literally were the only party house I knew of within a few square miles. One day during our first weekend at the house, we hear someone speak loudly in front of our house, so naturally we investigate. We find a man, I'd say in his early 40s, doing pull-ups from a limb of our tree. He sees us looking out the open door and yells for us to come introduce ourselves since we were his new neighbors. This guy was ripped. Not just for a 40-something-year-old. I'm saying you can see every fiber of his muscles. As we approach, I reach out my hand and introduce myself. He quickly smacks my hand away and firmly says, Never touch a black man's hand. I gave a short-lived giggle as I realized he was dead serious. To clarify, he was African American. He then introduces himself as Sherrod, the gatekeeper of heaven, but his real name is Alan. I've been sent there by God himself to keep anyone but the almighty white man out of heaven. He tells us he is in Jesus' original body, but he has adapted it to be fit for defending heaven, that his arms are his rifle stocks. When I ask him where he lives, sure enough, he points to the very next house. Great. I never felt threatened by the guy, but also always kept my wits about me when he was around. I didn't know the volatility of his mental state. Weeks go by with small interactions. Him doing push-ups in our grass, pull-ups from our tree while sharing ridiculous stories about his past. He explained to us that you must put your heart against Mother Earth to live a long, healthy life, 
and that if he doesn't do it, bad things will happen. This leads to when things starts going from comical to creepy. We had noticed that we hadn't seen him in our yard for a few days, so when we saw him walking out of his house, my buddy yelled at him, I haven't seen you working out. You better get on it, or bad things will start to happen. Sherrod visibly starts limping over, explains that he was riding his bike back from shooting pool. Jesus also taught him how to play pool and helped him fight off a motorcycle gang while he was there. And some woman, the Antichrist, had seen him coming and stuck her foot into his spokes and sent him flying and he landed on his heart, so he needs to give it time to heal. The way he told the story was hilarious. He didn't mean it to be, but it took everything we had not to bust up laughing. Well, as bad random fortune would have it, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, died of a freak accident the following day. My buddy and I were getting home from work right at the same time the following day when Sherrod comes running over. You knew! Pointing right at my friend. You knew that I wasn't putting my heart to the ground and something bad was going to happen. We didn't know about Irwin's death, so we're both thinking, Oh, what happened? What has he done? Mother Earth couldn't feel my heartbeat, so she had to take a person of nature to remind me that I can never stop. She took that crocodile hunter. The crocodile hunter. This is when he decided we were more than just neighbors. We were prophets. He named my friend Peepsight because he can see the future. He named me Honcho. He said I was very special and am the equivalent of God on Earth and that everyone, including him and Peepsight, must worship me. Okay, weird. But this guy clearly is mentally unstable. I have an aunt with paranoid schizophrenia, so I'm thinking with super qualified medical knowledge that he suffers from the same thing. This is exactly something she would say. But instead of me being God, it would be Axel Rose. As weird as things are getting with the guy, we have no reason to fear him. He is always very energetic and happy to see us. I mean, he would never do anything bad to a god or prophet, right? But he did get weirder by the day. The day after Sherrod gave us our new titles, I hear Peepsight yell for me in a nervous tone to come to the back door. There they stood. Sherrod is opening a bottle of olive oil and telling my buddy to take his shirt off. He's telling us he needs to anoint us. I gotta bless those wings, he said. At this point, I'm thinking this whole thing has run its course and is now just plain annoying. We both tell him no and absolutely not, not taking our shirts off so you can rub oil on us. We settle on letting him rub a drop on our foreheads, hoping that will make him leave us alone. He gave me the bottle of olive oil and said I can now start blessing those who deserve it, and told my friend that he needs to protect the house and to make everyone who comes over say, Praise Jesus. If they can't or won't say it, it's because they're demons. He knocked on our door the very next day and asked if he could come in. Friend yelled, Let me hear you say praise Jesus. He swore and walked away. Guess that wasn't weird at all. Weeks go by with the average interactions. We've all been pretty disengaging with him as, like I said, the hilarity of the situation has worn off. One afternoon while loading my suitcase into my car when he pops up out of nowhere. Where are you going? And this is where the weirdest stuff happened with Sherrod and the only time I felt nervous that something might go down. He pulls out a bag of razor blades and asks if I can do him a favor. He tells me that Jesus ordered him to save all his razors he uses to shave his head and that one day someone important will come along that can take them and dump them into the ocean for him. Yeah. Not gonna happen. I tell him there's no way I will be getting a bag of razors past security and I would never dump anything into the ocean, let alone razor blades. He tells me that Jesus will make sure security won't find the bag and nothing bad will happen if they are in the ocean. I'm adamant that this is not going to happen and with every no, I can see him get a little angrier, a little more intense. This was the anger from desperation and you know the saying, Desperate times call for desperate measures. So, this put me on high alert. I mean, he literally has hundreds of razor blades in his hand. God knows what kind of disease you could get if one of those cut you. 
He truly believed this is how the story was supposed to go. After what seemed like an hour-long discussion slash argument, it was probably ten minutes in reality, he was defeated. He stormed off, muttering beneath his breath that I couldn't make out. Turned and screamed obscenities at me multiple times, but that was the end of the conversation. After spending a week in Hawaii, a week without dealing with the crazy neighbor, anxiety of having to deal with him hit while on my way home. However, luck was on my side. While I was gone, Sherrod was arrested. I can't remember the exact charges, but it was bad. I want to say some form of assault and various drug charges as well. We also found out this wasn't the first time, and that the house next door was a halfway house. So this happened about six months ago. I'm originally from a town in the north of the UK, but I was living in a different part of the country at the time for university. I was just going into my second year, so I had moved from student accommodations, like halls, to a house share with four other girls. We were in a pretty nice house in a small dead-end street, and all the shops and bars were at the end of our street. I was in a bedroom that was on the bottom floor and at the front of the house. It had originally been a living room but had been changed into a bedroom for student housing. Because it used to be a living room, the window was a huge bay window that took up the entire length of the front wall. The house had a big driveway and a front garden, both with fences around. This meant that you couldn't walk past the front of the house without intending to be there. You would have to walk up the driveway. I had been living in the house for about two weeks when this happened. On this particular night, there was only two of us in as our other three roommates had gone home for the weekend. The other girl that was in had a second floor bedroom, also on the front of the house. It was around 2am and I was sat in bed watching Netflix. I didn't usually stay up this late, but I was talking to a new boy at the time and I would often stay up late just to talk to him. Sad, I know, but new relationships are exciting. I remember wanting to go to sleep at about 12.30 and deciding to stay up for a bit longer to talk to him and now I'm so glad that I did. At this time I was quite naive and didn't really think much about the dangers of not locking doors and leaving windows open. I grew up in a very nice area where we didn't even really have to lock our doors and so I still wasn't out of this mindset. This experience has definitely changed that. Because of this... I had one of my windows slightly open and my curtains were open. The curtains didn't matter too much because the way the house was built, the garden and trees were right in front of my window, meaning no one could see in unless they stood directly in front of it. Being naive, I didn't think there was a possibility that anyone would try to. I was half lying down, half sitting up in bed with my laptop in front of me. I didn't have my laptop on too high a volume as, although she was upstairs, there was another girl in the house and I wanted to be respectful. All of a sudden, I saw a shadow go past my window, like a person walking past. I immediately froze. Like I mentioned earlier, there was no way someone could just walk past unless they walked down my driveway and were specifically coming to my house. I thought maybe someone had walked down the wrong driveway or was possibly cutting through and was going to jump the fence to another house. Something didn't sit right about this at all, however, so I left my laptop running and just looked at the window for a second. I couldn't see out the window at all since it was so dark outside, but I could make out shadows on the wall just next to it. For a second there was nothing, then a shadow of a man went past, then the shadow of another man about two seconds afterwards. At this point, I knew something was wrong and I shut my laptop immediately in the hope that if they looked in the window, they wouldn't see me. A bit of time went past, maybe like a minute or two, and I just sat in the pitch black waiting to see if I saw anything else. After this bit of time went by, another shadow of a man went past my window in the opposite direction, as if they had both walked in front of my window into the back of the house, but only one came back. I was certain at this point that they were doing something wrong, but for some reason, I could not move. My brain was trying to process a million things at once and I was so scared that I froze. I felt like if I moved then they would know I was there and 
I had no idea whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. For all I knew, they could have been hoping for a young 19-year-old girl to be inside, and I didn't want to run the risk of letting them know that there was. I was also completely naked under my covers, and it definitely crossed my mind that if I got up and they could see in the windows, they would see me. After what felt like an eternity of just sitting, waiting, I heard a loud bang on my window. It sounded like someone had hit something such as a rock off the window with force. I assumed they were trying to break the window and panicked hugely but still couldn't move. I can't explain what was going through my mind, but it was almost like I was waiting for a completely definitive thing to happen before I got up, as if I was being overdramatic or something. After the loud noise, I would say maybe 30 seconds went past, and then all of a sudden my curtains started moving, and I see a hand come round the side of them to get them out of the way. They were big curtains, and my openable windows were on either side of the big window, meaning they were slightly blocked even by the open curtains. I then looked over to the curtains and see a figure of a man climbing through my window. He was halfway through my window with the top half of his body inside my room. This is when my mind finally decided that this was a fight or flight situation, and I shot up and ran towards my door on the other side of the room. It was locked, so I had to fumble for the key, turn it, and then open the door and run all the while making a huge amount of noise. I ran up the stairs and knocked on my roommate's room, still completely naked I should add, so the image she must have got when she opened the door is quite amusing to think about. She opened the door almost immediately, which I found odd for it being 2am, but I was thankful nonetheless. I told her what had happened and we locked her door and started panicking. Neither of us knew what to do as we had never been in a situation like this before. Being stupid and young, I decided to ring my mum. Completely not helpful to the situation, but I wasn't thinking straight. And she told me to ring the police immediately. So... We rang the police, and because we didn't know if the men were in the house or not, they arrived within two minutes, as if it may have been an act of burglary. I had left my laptop and all my possessions in my room, other than my phone, because it happened to be in my hand when I ran, so if they were in my room, they would have plenty to take. The police arrived, and we threw down some keys from the top window to them so they could let themselves in. They searched the whole house top to bottom and found no one. I went down when they assured us it was safe and checked my room and nothing had been taken. I knew for sure they mustn't have even come into my room at all as my laptop was clear as day on my bed and would have been the first thing that they had seen if they had. The police agreed that I must have scared them off by getting up as they mustn't have been expecting anyone to be in. They must have thought the room was a living room as it made sense for it to be and have been expecting to rob the house while everyone was asleep upstairs. I had this crazy thought process through all of this where I started wondering if I had seen what I thought I had, and started doubting myself and wondering if I was just insane, but when I went down to check my room, my window had been completely open to its fullest extent. I had opened it only a crack at most, and this just confirmed that what I had seen was completely real. I learned a valuable lesson about leaving windows open that day for sure. While the police were there, they actually got radioed about an attempted robbery just a couple of streets along from mine, and they suspected it was the same two men. Nothing ever came back about that though, so they mustn't have caught them, unfortunately. They told us that if they did catch anybody engaging in any similar crime, they would get back in touch, but to this day, they haven't so either they had been caught and not connected to my case, or they haven't been caught at all. CSI came the next day and actually managed to get a fingerprint from the window, but they said the person must have been sweating or something as the fingerprint was too smudged to get anything from. I'm so glad I decided to stay up later, as if I hadn't been awake for this, they would have physically been in my room by the time I noticed that they were there, or they noticed me. The thought of waking up to two men in my room is terrifying, and I'm not sure what they would have done if they had got into the room before realizing, as there was then no easy escape for them. They would have had to have climbed out the tiny window again or unlock my bedroom door and then the front door to get out. 
This might have led to a violent and nasty situation and if they had realized they were stuck in a room with an eyewitness and it doesn't bear thinking about. Also, my roommate told me after the police left that she had actually woken up for some reason about five minutes before I came flying up the stairs and she said she heard the loud bang on my window when she was already awake. She started to get a bad feeling after that and had waited up for a bit sitting on the end of her bed next to the door just in case I came running up. It's very interesting that she woke up during this as the men were not loud at any point other than when they hit the window. Maybe that says a lot about the body's ability to detect danger. I, unfortunately, ended up not being able to sleep in that room after that without having all the lights on and soon after decided to move back home for university because I felt so uneasy living down there. I have so many experiences that belong here. Now this happened when I had just turned 18 about 5 years ago so some details are hazy but most are still extremely clear. It was my first job just as a convenience store cashier in a pretty low traffic plaza within walking distance from my house, and I was pretty good at working there. My managers liked me because I followed the rules due to a fear I've always had about getting in trouble. Unfortunately, my managers also did not do anything when I was harassed, which happened pretty much three or more times a week. Now, I was 18, but I looked about 14. I constantly got asked, and still five years later if I was even old enough to be working. So when I got hit on by much, much older men, it wasn't just creepy, it was bordering on predatory behavior. A 30-year-old man charmed me into giving him my number once, and when I told him how old I was, he said, Wow, I thought you were a lot younger. <laughs> That's good. So, he thought I was younger than 18, and still wanted to date me and the conversation ended there. At this point though, besides the weekly guys hitting on me, and at that time I was threatened by an old guy on what had to have been hardcore meth to kill me with his chicken wing bone while eating it, nothing really crazy had happened. I hoped it wouldn't because, again, no one ever did anything even when I complained. 9.57 one night before closing at 10, a younger looking kid comes in, probably mid-twenties, patchy beard that looks like when a 15 year old tries to grow one. Looks like he still lives in mommy's basement playing video games. You know, that kind of guy. He comes in alone, gets a drink, and messes around the store until we make the announcement that we are closing in one minute. Then he comes up to the counter, gives me a really creepy grin, and starts chatting. From the get-go, I had this weirdly bad vibe about this dude and my manager is in the office doing closing stuff, so I'm checking him out, but by myself. He's just being really creepy. When the register opens to give him his change, he starts chuckling and saying, Well, that's a lot. Well, can, can I have some? And leaning over the counter. I actually thought he was going to rob me. But I'm a nervous person with anxiety, so I was stammering and laughing nervously and pretending it was normal, and he leans even closer and says, Huh, oh, you just want to go home, don't you? You just want to go home, right? You really just want to go home. And the creepiest voice that I imagine a kidnapper would use to taunt his victim. That's literally what it sounded like. It was terrifying. Then he leaves and we close. I was scared to drive home and felt like I was being followed or watched. I don't see him for a few days and then he comes in again pretty close to closing time with his girlfriend, who later I realize always had this weird look on her face, like maybe deep inside she didn't want to be there or around him, but was still affectionate to him and all that, so I said, oh, thank God, maybe he won't be creepy to me. And sure, that time it was a little bit better. He was still incredibly weird, but she was nice and it was easier to talk. Then there was a third time about a week or so later. He came in with the girlfriend again, but she walked out as he came to pay. Again, it was close to closing and there was really no one there. Again, a manager wasn't around and this is the part that isn't hazy at all because it was just so creepy. 
and the conversation went like this. So I uh, talked to my girlfriend. She likes you. If you wanted to, uh, you know, get together with us, she'd be down. After staring at him for about 15 seconds straight, what? Him, smiling creepily. Yeah, would you be down? Hmm? I literally can't believe this is happening at this point. I'm like nervously laughing and shaking my head and saying, Uh, no, no thank you. Thanks, no. And then he gets all close and looks me dead in the eye with the smile and lowers his voice and says, You could be my girl, just like her. How does that sound? You could be so happy with us, with me. You could quit this job. You won't have to work at all. I pay the rent, for her clothes, everything. Anything she wants, I get. Anything you want, I get you too. What about that, hmm? It'll be so good. And as he's saying this, he keeps leaning further over the counter, and I just said, No, like, uh, n no? No. Then he grabbed his stuff, because during all of this, I had been awkwardly checking out his stuff, and winks at me and says, If you ever change your mind, and walks out. And then next time, I see him come in as I'm checking out another guy, and I mutter something along the lines of, Oh God, this guy again. Turns out I was checking out his brother, and apparently they were also with their mother, who proceeds to tell this creep I said that about him, and creep comes up and all of course creepily says, Do you not like me? I heard you didn't want to talk to me. Hurt my feelings. Why are you saying that stuff about me? And I was just nervously brushing it off and didn't know what to do. And then he left and I never saw him or his girlfriend again. My manager didn't do anything. Just laughed about it and said, What? What the heck? And went about her business. Only one newer supervisor said that was unacceptable and she would tell him to leave if he ever came in again. But thankfully, he didn't. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly, and if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. All the links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.